Disrupting Japan, Episode 18. Welcome to Disrupting Japan, straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening. You know, for all the differences that fascinate us between Western and Asian cultures, there are far more similarities. In almost all cases, products and services that do well in the West do well in Japan, and vice versa. This is particularly true in the B2B and enterprise space, where the value propositions tend to be fairly clear and translate fairly directly. The packaging and positioning may have to be tweaked a bit, but at the end of the day, we all value similar things. We're not really that different. Now that said, when we find something that is truly different, something unique, it's worth paying attention to, and that's what we have this week. Yuta Inoue runs Quantum. It's kind of a combination startup incubator, open innovation training firm, and creative agency. And, well, I'll let Yuta explain it in detail during the interview. While others, including me sometimes, have complained about Japan's lackluster M&A activities and the general risk aversion of corporate Japan... Utah and Quantum have come up with a model that simply bypasses these concerns and has found a uniquely Japanese way to provide startups with exits and large companies with a way to acquire new technologies in a way in which all parties seem comfortable. Quantum was launched a little more than a year ago, and it's already having an impact. There is now strong interest in replication of the model overseas, but there are some concerns that it might not work outside of Asia. Now, I don't want to say any more, and you'll be able to draw your own conclusions during the interview, and I'd love to hear your thoughts afterwards. So without further ado, let's get right to the interview. I'm sitting here with Yuta Inoue of Quantum. Mm -hmm. It's well, what I think is a very unique Japanese approach to incubation. Mm. And just so our listeners know, you helped establish the quantum group inside Hakuhodo, mm -hmm. which is the second largest ad agency in Japan. Mm -hmm. Your main focus is helping large companies work with creative, innovative young people to help develop new products. Mm -hmm. um, that's my understanding of it, but I've got a feeling you can mm -hmm. explain it much better. <laughs> so <laughs> can you kind of explain what quantum's mission is yeah. and, and how you're yeah. working with these companies? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that was pretty much kind of enough explanation. <laughs> but I'll start with the kind of background. Okay. So our kind of parent company is TVW Hakodo. So it's kind of joint venture of Hakodo and TVWA, which is a global ad agency, you know, headquartered in New York. Right, right. And it's not just a you know, Japanese huge company, but right. it's a kind of com combination of Japanese traditional company and the, you know, um, foreign company. So that's the kind of our root. But it's kind of, it's kind you know? of unusual to have large ad agencies so invested in incubation mm. and... From Hakoro perspective, so they are going to change themselves. They created a new slogan for themselves, the company to invent future. So that's the kind of new definition for Hakoda Group, which is um, ambitious. Yeah. But still, you know, basically their business is just creating ads, selling ads. Right, right. So that is kind of the, you know, very stretched goal. Well, that, and also from, it, it sounds like a slogan an advertising company would, would make up. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least they are trying to realize it, yeah, even yeah. in a small size. So we Quantum is for them one of their you know, experiments. So we are the kind of so kind of the good place for experiment. What is it Hakuhodo wants from Quantum? Mm. So most incubators for for people in America or Europe, when they think of an incubator, it really is people applying to the incubator, pitching their ideas, and then going out in the market and sink or swim. Mm. But Quantum's mission seems to be more matching up these creative people and new ideas with large Japanese companies. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So from Hakodo perspective, it's basically kind of a new service for you know, existing clients. Yeah. And Hakodo has more than several thousand 
clients in Japan. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. basically, they cover all the big companies. They want to create a new service line for them, but also from different perspective. Inside Hakodo Group, also Chibijabe Group, right? There are a lot of creative talents. So designers, UX designers, product designers, or、um, concept creators. So a lot of creative talents. So we believe that we can leverage those talents to kind of revitalize、um, Japanese corporations, new businesses, also to help startups in Japan. Right. So it's not simply, even though it's it's coming in from sort of that marketing connection. The larger companies don't just want the marketing exposure of, of I don't know, being associated with a fashionable startup.、Uh-huh. They're、uh-huh. they're actually using Quantum for product development and innovation as well. Yes, yes. Actually, that's our focus: creating new services or creating new businesses. Yeah.、Mm. Well, it's a very open-minded approach that、mm-hmm. the the clients seem to be taking. So, so tell me a bit about your customers.、Mm-hmm. Who who's、mm-hmm. most interested in using Quantum as a resource、mm-hmm. to develop new products? Yep.、Um, one of our focuses is IoT, Internet of Things. Yeah. So naturally,、um, the one of our biggest client area is hardware manufacturers.、Mm-hmm. So, for example, we help、uh, Okamura, which is the biggest office furniture company in Japan. Right. So, so would a company like Okamura come to you and say, "Look, give us something cool, Internet of Thingsy that we can work <laughs> into our product line?" Actually, beginning is like that usually. Okay. So、um, the projects always start with kind of vision creation. So we do the workshop with management. By those workshops, we kind of form visions and philosophy for their new businesses. Okay. So, for example, for Kamura case, we created the vision, a cognitive furniture. Cognitive furniture. So the furniture is that understands you, and the furniture is kind of you know offer services based on your situation. That's the kind of the furniture we want to create. You're going to have to give me an example. Yeah, yeah. I can't quite.、Uh... <laughs> so what、yeah. what what is my furniture、yeah, going to do for, for me? For example,、um, <laughs> one of our、um, project is standing desk. Uh-huh. So now, based on some interviews, there are some issues related to that. You need really the best height for you. So the desk somehow realizes how high it's supposed、yeah. to be for you. Yeah. So with, with senses, senses, senses your body, and kind of offer you the best height for you. With one click, you get a、uh, the best height for you. Now we are also、um, dealing with apps. Mm-hmm. That kind of notifies you when you should make it standing desk or lower lower one. So that's、right. also based on some science. You got a notification from your app. So that, sit down. <laughs> yeah, sit down or you know、um, stand. Well, sure, and I'm sure once you're when you're involved with your work, yeah, you can just end up sitting down for you know four hours straight、mm-hmm. if your head's down in code or something. Yeah, yeah, and that would be harmful for your body. So that's. Totally new thing for Kamura, so we invite, for example, the startup who are good at censoring, or startup good at data mining,、mm-hmm. or startup good at、uh, creating apps. So, do you go out to the startup community、uh-huh. and try to find startups that that fit that mold for them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's really different compared to seed accelerators in the market. Right. So, but we do have really specific focus for each. Project. Well, I'd say this is—it's really interesting because、mm-hmm. this very much is a—I I think it's showing the Hakuhodo roots. This、mm-hmm. is very much an agency approach、mm-hmm. to entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah.、Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a unique approach. You're doing well with it, obviously.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, at the the office party last week, I got、mm-hmm. a chance to meet a lot of your new hires. Yep. And it is very much like most. Ad agencies in that a lot of very creative people,、mm-hmm. a lot of new grads with no business experience,、mm-hmm. but great, interesting, crazy ideas they want to、yep. try out.、Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we help big corporations in terms of providing those in you know, a new energy or speed or new technology.、Mm-hmm. But also, we are helping those young talents in Japan. To let them leverage those big corporations' asset or resources, right? 
Um, I used to help my friends who found their own startups in Japan. The brand asset or、um, social, I would say, recognition for startup guys is really limited compared to the U.S. or the at least the Silicon Valley. I th- yeah, I think so too. It's it's getting better, but、mm-hmm. Japanese consumers, Japanese businesses, they're not early adopters in mm-hmm. general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it is harder for startups to get that initial traction. Yes, yes. So it's much much easier for startups to kind of、um, leverage that resources. Sure, easier to partner with a big company than、yes. to try to go it alone. Yes, yes. So some of the work you do, you do outreach to the startup community to try to find the right products and services.、Mm-hmm. But you also have an in-house creative team, right? Yes. So yes. what's the balance there? Uh huh. Uh huh. So basically, we have I said two pillars for our business. So one is. The corporate accelerators or、um, innovation consulting business—it's、so、basically you know helping big corporations with connecting startups. Right, right. But also we have another pillar, which is、uh, we, we call it quantum makers. So we make our own product,、uh-huh. making a prototype for that.、Uh, try to find a partners to market those products. Also, we make marketing campaign for that. So we do everything for that. Right. So, so by doing it. We also experiencing the you know the issues which our clients are facing. So by doing that, we are kind of learning every day. Right. Also, that would be a you know new revenue source for that. If you're in house teams,、uh-huh. if those teams develop a a successful new product,、yep. would you spin that out into a separate company? Or- so that's a kind of weird、um, a discussion. Okay. But now we are trying to create a new brand for that. So, because Quantum Makers is name of the you know business,、so、right? It's not a brand. So, because we got some、um, international awards for our products, so we got a、um, Red Dot Design Award, best of the best, for one of our products. So now we are in the discussion of you know which logo would be the suitable for for a brand, and so we are kind of creating a new team, new logo, new brand brand for that. So that could be a、um, new company in the future. What's interesting to me is the whole agency model、mm-hmm. of entrepreneurship.、Mm-hmm. Of the the startup founders I've known, both in Japan、yep. and in the West, tend、mm-hmm. to be fiercely independent people. <laughs>、um, yeah, yeah. Very stubborn in a good way. Uh huh.、Uh-huh. Usually in、I、a good、agree. way. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> but what I was, what was interesting about the group I was meeting last week、mm-hmm. were these were very. Passionate people who wanted to create things,、mm-hmm. but had absolutely no desire to start their own company、mm. or have anything to do with business.、Mm. Are there a lot of people like that in Japan? Do you think this is a a model that will become successful throughout Japan?、Mm. I think there are a lot of people like that in Japan, but I think the reason they say, you know, I'm not interested in to create a new new company or my own company is maybe they、uh, humble. Because probably they have some interest in that. <laughs> okay. But you know they are humble. Also, they, to some extent, they are kind of risk averse. People who are creative, people who are smart, people who are, but you know, risk averse. There are not so many places、um, kind of suitable for them in Japan now. Yeah. The team like Kuntam, or maybe the teams we are helping, could be you know the best place for them. Why、well, I suppose for those people it's really the best of both worlds.、Mm-hmm. They they get to create and make cool new things,、yeah. and still have a a salary coming in.、Mm-hmm. It sort of reminds me、mm. of the the way the music industry works in Japan, uh-huh. Uh-huh. which is also rather unique in the world,、mm. where record labels employ、uh, hundreds of artists、mm-hmm. on salary. Yeah. And then, depending on the trends or the evaluation of senior management, they'll pick a few to promote and become stars.、Mm-hmm. I don't think anywhere else in the world works quite like that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Interesting. So I'm wondering if if this model is going to be similar、mm. with the way of nurturing creative uh-huh. entrepreneurs. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would say probably the way of leveraging internal resources, you know, those creative talent, a little bit similar to that probably. But from a startups, we are for them. It's their own businesses, and they want、oh, right, to you know, create、right. big, big businesses. For for them, so it's the quantum is a kind of resource where they can, you know, 
collaborate with big corporations smoothly. Mm-hmm. So we basically do everything. We coordinate a meeting. We do a facilitation for the meeting. You're, we, you're being an agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We write a draft for the, you know, their, their collaboration or business alliance. With that, they can focus on their own business. Do you think this is a model that is, do you think it would work overseas too? Mm. Actually, or do you think it's better, it's better suited to Japan? Yeah, I think it's better suited to Japan or similar market, I guess. Yeah. Actually, we got a, a lot of inquiries from TVWA Worldwide Networks. Right. So a lot of people think that this is kind of cool new model for agencies. So maybe uh, we can kind of uh, modify it and expand it to globally. All right. As a new business of agencies. But hmm. it, from a, from an incubator perspective, it's probably only applicable for Asia or other more kind of conservative market with conservative big corporations. Okay. Well, actually, uh, last year, mm-hmm. Quantum launched Firefly. Yeah. Right. Your your first global public product. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't you just kind of tell us the story of that briefly? Uh-huh. Like, I mean, what was the process? Uh-huh. How was it commissioned? Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> sure, sure. As I said, we have a quantum makers initiative. So inside that, we have some project. So one of them is uh, related to artificial intelligence. One of them related to boats. Right, right. The another one is related to bicycle culture. Steve Firefly is the first product for the, the last bucket. For the bicycle culture. Yeah. So we call that cycling well robots. All of those projects started with a single passion guy. Right. As a beginning, all of them were kind of small, tiny project, kind of side project. So, so you had a bunch of different people working on different ideas. Differently. Okay. When they got some credit from outside, yeah. for example, um, there is a artificial intelligence kind of small car project. I, I don't know the English name, the Minionku. Oh, like like matchbox cars or yeah, yeah, Hot yeah. Wheels type yeah, of yeah. toy. Okay. So kind of we are kind of putting the artificial intelligence on the car. On the little yeah. tiny cars. Yeah. Oh, that explains the little racetrack I yes, saw outside. Yes, All yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, made that kind of alliance with artificial intelligence um, study group in Japan. Huh. You know, to- Todai or other universities. So that's kind of the you know credit from outside group. Right, right. So after that, we made it kind of official project for the cycling variables. First, that was the kind of more personal side side project. But she submitted to the Red Dot Award, uh-huh. and we got a best of the best for that. So we kind of. Decided to focus on that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, good positive feedback. Yeah. So more. <laughs> What's I mean? I think for the listeners, yeah. we should explain what it is. Mm, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so the City Firefly is basically a key lock for so bicycle. A basically. bicycle lock. Yes, bicycle lock. But at the same time, that could be your kind of safety gear for you with light. Right. So in in the night, it, it will be. Re- the visible from the you know car drivers. So it's the bicycle lock that. You can take the lock off mm-hmm. and put it over your shoulder. Yes. And yes. it'll glow and make you visible at night. Yes. So yes. it's a lock and a safety device as well. Yes. Especially in Europe, a lot of people are commuting via bicycles. Yeah. Because of that, the number of injuries or deaths related to bicycle is kind of skyrocketing. Also, another trend that the psycho chic. So uh-huh. the cycling is kind of the symbol of new lifestyle or um, new perspective. So, so it's a chance to introduce something that's genuinely new and different and stands yes. out. Yes. I got it. So there are a lot of new luggage brands or kind of um, upper brands for, for that culture. Right, right. But, you know, because of that, the risk of cycling, a lot of people wear jackets like... Some, some very bright, reflective... Yes, yes. So it's horribly not, not fashionable. No, not at all. Okay. But they want a more fashionable culture for that. So there's a gap between those two. We are trying to kind of introduce products that, that can bridge those two issues. Interesting. So that's the kind of concept for the City Firefly. And, and we'll make sure to put a link to this on the, the website because ah, yeah. it's hard to describe it. But when <laughs> you really see true. it, you're like, ah, yes, I see exactly <laughs> what's happening that's here. That's really true. Right. <laughs> 
Let me ask you about your your focus on the Internet of Things, uh -huh. which, okay, it seems to be the official trendy buzzword of 2015. <laughs> yeah. But in a lot of ways, I think Japan is much stronger in hardware yeah. than it is in software. Mm -hmm. A lot of Japanese hardware manufacturers are kind of struggling now. Yeah. They used to be a, probably market leader, but now they are kind of losing that position. On the other hand, they still have smart talents. They still have、um, really high quality manufacturing. They have R&D resources, but there are some missing links. They are not good at user experience design for IoT world. Right, right. They are not, not good at just simply internet related things or apps.、Mm. So what we are doing is basically to provide solutions for those missing links. So we have our own UX designers. So they, they know hardwares, they know softwares, so they can design basically from end to end. Also, we have strong relationship with startups who are obviously good at internet or applications. By connecting our own user experience design capability, also big corporations hardware capability and startup software capability. That would be basically the recipe for you know, Japanese IoT. Well, that seems to make sense. It's、mm. a lot of filling in the gaps.、Mm. But I have seen a tremendous amount of creativity on the, the hardware side all over Japan.、Mm -hmm. And I, I, don't know, I, I think the next few years are going to be interesting. I think Japan、yeah. might really come into its own、yeah. with the Internet of Things boom.、Mm. Yeah, I believe so too. Also, there is another approach we are taking too.、Yeah. There are also a lot of hardware startups in Japan. Sure. But almost all of them have an issue of mass production or quality control. Oh, yeah. So after they you know, did a successful campaign for Kickstarters, then they start to, to face the real problems. Well, Japanese consumers, especially, are incredibly demanding about yeah. quality. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy here. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> so, for, for that, there are a lot of things that big corporations can help them. Okay. So, now we are kind of creating a new platform that matching the new startups with the big hardware manufacturers with manufacturing resources. Who know how to scale. Yes. And to make things quality that Japanese and world consumers expect. Yes, yes. I, I can see why this, this is something that really is. Maybe not unique to Japan,、mm -hmm. but especially valuable in Japan. Yep. But the flip side of that、uh -huh. is Japanese companies, I mean, Panasonic, Sharp,、uh -huh. Fujitsu, especially Fujitsu, <laughs> their RD and product development、uh -huh. is really strictly secret and internal、uh -huh. and closed. And That's very true. Now, I guess you guys are kind of going in from the marketing side. Yeah. But have you gotten any resistance or pushback from these uh -huh. companies uh -huh. saying, no, we don't want outsiders' products?、Mm -hmm. and, and how do you get over that? Yeah, actually, we are dealing with that almost every day. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> from the beginning of the project, almost all the clients say, we want to make it a closed project, or we want to make it a small trial project. Right. Or they just try to hide it for,、okay. at the beginning. But we try to convince them by opening up, there are a lot of opportunities coming. Are, are they、yeah. trying to hide the project because they're afraid it might damage the brand? Or are they trying to hide the project just to kind of protect their own territory inside the company?、Uh, I'll say there are three reasons. So, one is, as you said, try not to kind of damage their branding. Okay. The second reason is try to hide it from their competitor. Ah, okay. The last thing is, yeah, more, more like internal politics or their own way of protecting themselves. But kind of combination of all, all the three. So th this is what you spend most of your days dealing with. Yeah, I, I would say so. <laughs> so convince management that opening up would be, be beneficial for them. But I suppose it, it just takes examples. After you have a few success cases,、yes. companies will begin to understand、yeah. that. This is a new kind of resource for them to use. Indeed. Almost always try to make small successes really fast. Yeah. By showing those results to the management. Why don't we open up? By doing that, you can 
get a probably contact from the best startups in the market, or also you can get a potential customers. Right, um, it, would, it would strengthen the brand. I yeah, mean, in, in every way. Definitely. Huh. So that's basically one of the hardest things we are mm. kind of tackling. Well, you just started about almost exactly one year ago, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So okay, I mean, you're that's. That's moving pretty fast for Japan, <laughs> for large Japanese companies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that kind of effort is, can become successful. Yeah. The one, one of our clients um, used to be one of the toughest clients for us. The new business um, division leader said that the resources they can spend is two hours for the leader uh -huh. and just one staff, this new gadget. So very low level staff. Very, very low level. And with those resources, we designed a workshop with management and we made it successful, the, the workshop itself. All right. And after that workshop, I think within one month or so, so they created a new division for that, specifically for that business and hire five new staff for that. Holy cow. That's a huge success. Yeah. All of them happened just in three months. That was kind of really surprising for me too. Well, you must have done something right. <laughs> <laughs> when we, you know, leveraged copywriters for that, designers for that, so all of the ideas kind of visualized more kind of... Well, so, the, so the, your clients could actually see the products taking shape. They, yes. they could see this as an entire process, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And with that, those top management made a really quick decision. That's really encouraging. Yeah. Do you think this is a long-term solution to help Japanese companies innovate? Do you think this is a transitional approach, or do you think that this kind of matching service is something that's here to stay, will become a common part of the Japanese technology landscape? Mm -hmm. The matching business itself, it will be more transitional one. Okay. So maybe within 10 years or something, probably a lot of big corporations can, can do that by themselves, I think. Right. But more kind of deeper side, so how to make decisions, how can they create a successful internal culture, all, all of those, it, it can be easily um, copied or learned. All of those are kind of, are kind of you know, strong core asset, I guess. So you think, that, you think that large Japanese companies will learn to innovate? Okay, that's, well, th there's two, two schools of thought. Yeah. In Japan. Or I should say three. There's the school of thought that says, okay, it's just all over. Japan's not uh -huh. going to, you know. Yeah. And neither one of us really buy into that. Mm -hmm. There's another group of people that think, okay, big Japanese companies are not going to be able to innovate, but uh -huh. we have these new small startups uh -huh. that are going to challenge the big companies, uh -huh. and they'll innovate, so everything will be okay. Mm -hmm. But you're actually saying, no, the large companies will learn to change. They'll mm -hmm. learn to innovate. Yep. You think so? Yeah. I'd love to see that happen. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> it would be good for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there are people inside those big corporations who are definitely trying to change their own companies to be innovative. Yeah. Almost always we try to reach top management too, but they're definitely kind of passion guys inside those companies and they sometimes do things outside their job de job definition right it, it would be amazing to see yeah. japan inc the large japanese companies mm. return to their innovative history and a lot of our listeners are probably too young to re realize that uh -huh. companies like sony and honda and toyota used to be incredibly mm. innovative companies mm -hmm. And it wasn't, you know, it was a generation ago. It wasn't yeah. that long ago. And it would be amazing to see that come back. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there are a lot of issues. At least we see some, you know, passion guys within those Japanese big corporations. Also, by connecting those passion guys and those creative talent inside Japan, we've already seen some successful cases. So I believe by expanding it, I think we can make some... The role models for that. Yeah. And by showing that, I think a lot of Japanese companies will at least cop try to copy those. Okay. So that, that would be the kind of well, let's, big let's, time for us. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to, to pull out your crystal ball yeah. and look into the future. Uh -huh. And so 20 years from now in Japan, uh -huh. do we have 
innovative large companies and a startup ecosystem coexisting mm-hmm. happily? Mm-hmm. Do we have innovative companies and a lot of sort of innovative agencies like Quantum, mm-hmm. you know, filling the gap? What do you think the innovation landscape will look like in Japan in mm-hmm. the next 10 or 20 years? I see. I think the biggest change will happen in those next coming 10 or 20 years will be a more kind of liquidity of creative talent. Those creative talent who are in big corporations or startups or agencies like us will kind of you know, move around. So, so you some, think the creatives will start changing jobs more frequently? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And they will be the kind of change makers inside both startups, big corporations, even for agencies, I guess. Okay. So those talent would change the culture inside big corporations. For startups, those talent will, will learn how to deal with those big corporations. So that would be the kind of biggest change will happen. Okay. So, and that would be the kind of core of Japanese innovation. That, that system, sounds like a, a very, a very Japanese, a, a much more orderly system yeah. than exists yeah. in the US or, or, or Europe. Yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. Yeah. It, it is kind of the best of both worlds where, you would have the innovative small startups, uh-huh. you would have the companies, the agencies in the middle, helping them partner with larger companies, uh-huh. not just investing and saying good luck, yeah. but staying involved long term. Yeah. And you would have some of the bigger Japanese companies, let's say, remembering uh-huh. how to innovate again. Uh-huh. I'd like to see that. I hope I will see that in the yeah, next 10 years yeah. or so. We, we try to realize that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an incredibly optimistic point to end on. Yeah. But before we close up, uh-huh. do you have anything you want to say to our listeners about mm. innovation in Japan or Japanese startup? For the, the big corporations, the, one of the, the biggest walls before them yeah. to innovate is the one, their own attitude toward innovation. In so, what way? So, I mean, everybody says they like innovation. Yeah, yeah. So they need to change themselves to make innovation. So for some of them, think that if they borrow some power from startup, they can create a new businesses. Uh, okay. Or if they find a new ideas, that would just lead so, them to innovation. So they think they can hire you to go out and find yeah. them some innovation? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and bring it back? Yeah. That, that never happens. No. So yeah. <laughs> they need to change themselves. Especially... They need to change their evaluation system for new ideas or mm-hmm. new businesses. Their existing system, like discounting cash flows or other <laughs> evaluation system, will never fit to new ideas yeah. for the new market. So they need to have their own system for that. They need to have their own decision-making process for that. They need to have their own team for that. They can just try to try to make a new innovation. That's the kind of starting point. Right, right. But a lot of people don't really think that they do that much. So you think that the big Japanese company, they don't quite realize how much they have to change? They, they, they haven't realized yet. But they will? I, th- I think they will. I guess they'll have to yeah. at one point. Mm. But at least my clients, they are starting to notice it and they are changing. Yeah. And all of them are in traditional conservative Japanese big corporations. Right, right. So that's the kind of hope. They changed. So that means all the Japanese corporations can change. Okay, well, I hope, I hope that's exactly what we're going to see in the next yeah. 10 years. <laughs> Let's end on that optimistic note. Yeah. Uh, Yuta, thanks so much for sitting down Thank with us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we're back. The agency model of startup innovation, it's an interesting idea and it seems to be gaining some traction. Now, maybe the quantum model will be a transitional one, and the Japanese market will move to a startup and M&A model like we see in the U.S. and Europe. But maybe, as Yuta believes, this will be the blueprint for a model of repeatable, sustainable innovation that will be imitated and spread throughout Japan and perhaps the rest of Asia as well. And as Yuta points out, He's already beginning to see the changes, or at least the beginnings of the changes, at some of Japan's biggest companies. It'll be a decade before we have a definitive answer, of course, but in the meantime, I'd love to know what you think. 
please drop by disruptingjapan.com slash show 018 and leave a comment. I think we'll get some interesting feedback on this one. When you drop by the site, you'll also see the links and resources that Yuta and I talked about. And to get in touch with him if you have a great Internet of Things product that you think a large Japanese firm would be interested in. And most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.